turned 16, one of the first purchases I actually did, this is what I was calling as an adult, was I, it was a bike, and I hadn't had a bike in years, and so I actually started out by riding down in Tucson, Arizona, on their, what they had as their bikeways, and so ever since then, pretty much it's just been kind of a continual thing, and I've been enveloped in traffic, and just from the start, it seems like, <laughs> down there. So. Um, so I'm really happy to be here, and one of the things, so um, when putting together this presentation, um, I think the title was Designing for All for all Users, and as I started to put this together and throw together slides, started noticing that really it wasn't about all users, it wasn't, you know, because when we talk about that, sometimes we talk about freight and other users on our roadway systems, and it's, it's not so much about that. You know, really what we're trying to do is, you know, and I decided, go ahead and just try and rename it and just kind of talk about prioritizing people because that's really what we're doing here and you probably put some other little things like in slowing neighbor traffic and, and making life more livable in our in our neighborhoods so i just want to go ahead and kind of give a you know just kind of ask everyone here so how many of you have heard of the, the nacto urban bikeway design okay let's go ahead and keep your hands up if uh, if we're uh, as we go through all right how many have heard of the mutcd okay how about that Ashto Ped and Bike Guide? Curve one, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Have you heard of ProWag? Okay. This is actually the ADA, their guidelines. And how many have heard of this book, Engineers Who Make Acronyms? <laughs> <laughs> it's not that really popular of a book. <laughs> I'm trying to get that on Amazon. It never comes up. <laughs> so. It's a real book. <laughs> I'm working on it right now. It's <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the things that that engineers in particular love to do is is we're very goal oriented people. I mean, we want to concentrate on something, and so what we do is oftentimes we go ahead and talk about design criteria. Like, what do we want? In things, and so I think this is probably pretty good to go ahead and, and talk about what do we want from the engineering way of what our greenways look like. And I went ahead and I took some of the information that that was from the presentation with Mark Lear and Greg Rasmussen down a few months ago, and um, and, and built this off here. And and so you know to, when we're talking about criteria, you know we're talking motor vehicle volumes being low, you know a thousand at the very top, hopefully closer to five hundred. Um, we also want a lot of peds and bikes. When I first put the slide together, it was uh, peds and bikes, one billion, but I think that's probably a little, little uh, uh, presumptive right now. Um, motor vehicle speeds, we want them to be low. I put 25 miles per hour here just because right now, that's the state, the state law that we're under. Um, probably expect, uh, hopefully, that that will not be knocked down to 20 miles per hour. Or at least give the cities the option to do it. And then finally, another one here, and this is actually a tool which has come out recently, is uh, pedestrian and bicycle quality. Um, they call it level of service. This was in the highway capacity manual. Um, it came out in 2010, it's an update. And so what this does is it allows a, a quantitative measurement of what oftentimes we do. Like for example, on intersections, we could say if there's a level of service C, we have a delay of 15 seconds, or I think it's 30 seconds average. But we haven't really had that tool for for bikes and pets to kind of understand what is a what, what kind of service are, are we providing them because the service it doesn't matter if a bike is waiting 30 seconds at an intersection if they don't want to be on the roadway in the first place. So so then to go ahead and talk about this pedestrian and bicycle quality, the quality of the route. And so just kind of breaking it down into to three different sections um, is how do we meet these goals? How do we meet these design guides? It's you know, and broke it down to three sections, and this is all things that that we're all aware of. Is is well, what do we do on the street on that street section? You know, and then what do we do at the intersection? And then finally, oftentimes to go back and to to measure what have we done? How how have things changed? How are we, are we seeing more kids out there, more seniors, just walking and biking and, and, and having fun? And then also, although we could, we'll, probably talk, we'll talk about this at the end, um, 
hopefully seeing that our safety has increased, that, that speeds have gone down and, and collisions have gone down. So I just want to go ahead and start with, with this, this kind of slide. Just two roadways. Um, and, and to talk about, well, what makes cars speed? And you probably looked at this and I was thinking, like, well, actually, it's the drivers who make cars speed. But, uh, but to look at the width of the roadways, to go ahead and see, like, the one on the right, it's incredibly wide. You could just easily drive and, you know, and, and hit the gas and probably go 30, 40 miles an hour before you hit an intersection. But on the right, or on the left here, a more, this is actually just a more uh, typical Seattle street. We've got the trees, the over canopy, we've got the cars parked in. It's really only able for one car at a time to come through. These are good. <laughs> we like these. <laughs> we want more of these, not so much of these. And so I want to go ahead and kind of just go ahead and give a kind of a quick case study on this. This was. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Sure. I was just trying to turn the lights down. <laughs> Oh, it didn't work. <laughs> oh, I like the lights. I need to see my. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. You can't see the picture. You know, the map's kind of hard to see, but this is uh, this is actually in the University District area. Um, Uni University Village is down here. Uh, here's 30th up here, right next to the cemetery. Um, 25th and 35th are on either side. This was a sidewalk. There was a, it's a four block section. Um, it had no sidewalks on. Unfortunately, I don't have a before picture to kind of show. But you can imagine, it's just pavement, trail, you know, just kind of merges into someone's yard. Um, so cars were parked everywhere, partially on the roadway, partially on the, on the shoulder. But there was no sidewalk and no curb. And cars were using this as a bypass because it was very easy to get down to U Village. There were no stop signs, nothing there to prevent anyone from going there. So it had about almost 3,000 vehicles a day, which is that upper threshold, even for, um, for a residential street to be taking so much traffic. And people were speeding. Um, the 85th percentile, and that's the speed at which 85% of the motorists are traveling at or below. So it's kind of just, just a big s stack of it. And this is, kind of, this is the tool that engineers often use when they're talking about speed. So if you hear that term, that's, that's what it means. And then, but 8% of the vehicles were going 35 miles per hour or faster. In fact, I think I saw the fastest speed on there was somewhere around 45 or 50 miles an hour in that section. So they were flying down this road. Well, so what happened? Came in, put in a sidewalk on the side here. And they, we did, it was only a sidewalk on one side. It wasn't even on the other side. It was just on one side. The volumes decreased almost by 1,000 vehicles a day. The 85th percentile dropped about three miles an hour. But the biggest thing was that only now 2% of the cars are going 35 miles per hour or above. So you can see that not only has the percentage gone down, but also the amount of vehicles going that fast has gone down because of the volumes. So, and this was, a, this was just one half of the road. If there, if there were funds to do the other half, probably see even, even a more reduction on that. This is kind of funny, actually. I remember when I was at the city at the time, they, um, we kept getting letters from folks who would used to go down this road. And I think I remember the funniest letter I got. I think it was via through the Seattle PI when they were doing the getting there column still. And so they were asking us to respond to it. It was, what mental midget designed this roadway? <laughs> it's always kind of fun to respond to those, those letters. <laughs> me, <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> I don't think that person lived around there. <laughs> so then also another thing um, is to go ahead and talk about the length of blocks. Oftentimes, you know, we're lucky in a lot of the center part of the city that the streets are pretty, the blocks are pretty short. We're only talking about 300 feet or so before another intersection. So it's really nice to have these compact blocks. But as we start to go further out, you start to see that those blocks increase and they get Faster. Even even some of um, some of the built up areas, maybe at you know the size of two blocks. And so this was a this was just a, a summary of a study that um, they did actually in Virginia. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to find out um, how to design proactively, so that they weren't coming back and putting in all this effort. That they were designing it right the first time. 
And so you can see that if we have really short blocks, we're, we're pretty close to the speed limit. But as we start getting farther, that everyone kind of picks up the speed. And so just to kind of talk about this, one of these areas was 42nd Avenue Northeast. This is actually out by Sandpoint and 123rd, where it turns into a, where Sandpoint turns into 125th. That whole section there, there was, a, you know, I mean, there's a pretty good volume there. Um, but the 85th percentile is about 33, so it was slightly higher than what we had on 30th, but 10% were going 35 miles per hour or above. And the average block was about 700 feet. Once you once you got out of this this area near near the area, so what happened was ended up putting in speed humps there. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the after study on that, but it did knock down those those speeds just by going out there and watching cars <coughs> get those bumps slow down, pick back up, and to go ahead and continue. So so that's those are some of the ideas of what we could do and use use kind of understanding maybe some of the geometrics of what we're talking about. And by the way, I probably should have said this in the beginning. If, if anyone has any questions or, or maybe like a situation that they ran across, for maybe, you know, feel free to go ahead and just raise your hand and stop me. And, you know, let's go ahead and kind of make this maybe less of a presentation, but more of a conversation, just kind of going back and forth. Yeah? Well, I have like a half a dozen. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> should we go back? <laughs> no, but I, so yeah. the motor vehicle volumes. So, yeah. you know, it's like, a, a thousand a day, yeah. And clearly, even on on residential streets, and in fact, very much on residential streets, there there rush hours. You know, there's there's you know most of the the, the the cars are you know dropping kids off to school or getting to work. And so, how, you know, how important is that kind of rush hour effect? That, that rush hour, like when I know a lot of times the the kind of rule of thumb is about ten percent mm -hmm. of traffic of that of those numbers are happening during that. Because if it's an empty street the rest of the day and that non-rush hour, is, it, is that different? Or, you know, how, is it different in um, how you would count that as a busy street versus a non-busy street? Because there's some that are just like super busy right. at super, certain hours. <clears throat> you know, I haven't run across treating it differently, I guess, but um, it's definitely something to look at and, and, and to see. Because I know, I mean, depending on like, for example, some of the streets, it kind of ranges between eight to twelve percent. I mean, typically we'll thumb we just use ten percent, but um, in between that, uh, definitely to go ahead and take a look at that and see where those volumes are. Not really answer your question. So I've got I'd have to think about that. <laughs> that was cool. Oh, well, other people. <laughs> <laughs> so are you saying like a speed hump could effectively cut the the, the length of the block down because it kind of acts as an intersection? that someone has to slow down. Exactly, because often if you don't have that interruption of traffic mm -hmm. at, at an intersection, that's where you start to get those right. people can run speed. So right, it, it's really, um, I should have put that on there, just, it, it, you're right, it interrupts that straight section. So okay. yeah, so something like that, maybe uh, a chicane, or um, even sometimes like a, an island treatment in the middle. Something that breaks up that long length how close together would you put those speed humps? Would you put them at the 300 feet level, 300 feet? Yeah. To make it a short, short block, essentially. You know, um, they're definitely it's definitely a site, a site specific type of application. Um, what's happened is to try and get close to that 25 mile per hour speed, the rule of thumb has been about 300, 350 feet. 40 second in particular, it has it about 350 feet average on that. Um, I know Mary Avenue, Northwest, kind of near that, near, that, uh, <laughs> near, the, near the Safeway there. Um, those are actually only about 200 feet apart from each other. I'd be really interested to see what those speeds are, to see kind of what those mid, and you know, not speeds really at the speed, not the, the midway point, because by that time you figure, we've hit the peak of, of accelerating now, we're starting to slow down for the next one. So, I have yeah. a question about chicanes. So we yeah. have chicanes on 57th going up, uh, up Finney, and people um, do race car driving up, up the is best. Yeah. Like they took out a whole set. So do you find that with chicanes? That, that people, that it, it interrupts, it makes the road narrow, but they still are driving recklessly because they think they're race car drivers. I haven't heard of it. Um, the, yeah. the, the, uh, 
Uh, during my time, uh, a lot of times, I mean, cause, um, just kind of like, you know, I mean, I was, I was four time oh, at the city of Seattle for the neighborhood traffic section. And so we worked with that. And, and so while I was there, I did hear that. But that doesn't mean that, I mean, obviously, yeah, you have seen that. So, yeah. So. Going back to 30th, sure. um, the reason why the vehicle slowed, was that because of narrowing of the street or because of the sidewalk and the curb? Sidewalk and the curb narrowed the street, right? Exactly, okay. yeah. Because what happened was we, uh, we pushed it out. It, it, the curb pushed it out, and then you know, the sidewalk pushed it out as well. You know, it was funny because that, that project was one in which um, the neighborhood had wanted a sidewalk for years. It um, finally, um, through a, a confluence of events, both the project 35th Avenue through Wedgwood, um, we were able to get the contractor to do this as a change order. Um, there was some funding from Bridging the Gap. Um, Mayor Nichols at the time, it was the only pedestrian project on the Dirty Dozen. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> um, so so it, it, got that, it got that traction to go ahead and do it and, and to get it completed, which was really nice. And, um, it was a concrete sidewalk. It's, um, I believe it was about $200,000 or something like that when all the costs came in. Mike, are you going to be talking more about sidewalks? Because this is something that we're really concerned with, with Greenways, because a lot of places that are ideal for Greenways don't have sidewalks. And we're just wondering about other ways of slowing traffic without a sidewalk because they are very expensive even for short bits of it. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, this project, I mean, with, with 30th was somewhere around, like I was saying, $200,000. For a block. For those right. well, four blocks, but still. <laughs> about $50,000 a block. And, and yeah. I think, I think there, there were some benefits of the scale that, that we got on that versus if you were just to come in and do a single block at um, mm -hmm. 70 to 100,000 is, mm -hmm. is what I've heard. So, so other ways of narrowing the street and allowing pedestrians to go on it? You know, uh, yeah, we definitely, I don't have a slide for that, but I would definitely love to talk about that. And so maybe we just go ahead and... and, and where I grew up, they didn't yeah. have sidewalk, well, part of the places where I grew up for part of my life, but <laughs> they didn't have sidewalks, and it was just common to walk in the street. You know, I know one of the, um, some of the stuff in um, Greenwood, they did some off of um, Evanston, I believe. They did those parking blocks. So what it is, they did parking blocks on the pavement, and then so you've got the pedestrian area reserved over here. And then I think they also did some some legends as well. So, so you have the pedestrian symbol with a couple arrows to go ahead and, and try and narrow it. And Evanston is a pretty tiny street uh, from that perspective. It, it's north of 85th on there. So that was um, that's something. Also, something is, is just general striping. If you go ahead and just striping out some areas, it's kind of a cheap way to do it. A, of a lot of times it's just like, you paint, you can do that for a lot less than 50,000 blocks. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so uh, s some of these I know we'll have to probably, uh, definitely have to go up the city, the city for all this. On that. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen that yet in, in, in the city. I don't know. Um, feel free if anyone has <laughs> seen it. Something you said earlier, yeah. it's like level of service. Yes. Level of service. Yes. Um, I'm playing with words because I do that, but level of service <laughs> <laughs> sort of came to mind on there. Yeah. Um, somebody said that actually when they got their street, sort of a dip in the street filled, it increased the speed. So don't push too much for level streets. <laughs> um, cars hate it. Bikes can accommodate it a little bit. Not too much, but it's kind of nice to have them a little ratty. You know, it's funny. I remember once seeing a, seeing a discussion about about leaving potholes as a traffic off device. Oh. <laughs> this guy, I'm not sure what he was teasing, but he said he went out and got his neighbors to help dig it back up again. Because <laughs> it was asphalt. <laughs> it, was big, right? it wasn't concrete. He reinstituted the pothole. <laughs> and for a speed bump. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, as you're talking yeah, about, yeah, on 28th, absolutely. there's some, some speed bumps that I actually take them faster in a car because they're more fun. <laughs> that it's wide enough, I can do it. And I've got a $1,200 car, so who cares? But the thing that I like about it is there's a hole through the middle because as a bike, I don't have to give myself spinal conditions. It's got that drainage, that drainage cut in the middle there. Yeah, and I can speed through that without jolting me. <laughs> we'll pretend. We'll pretend. 
So yeah. I've, heard, I've heard people say they want to slow some stuff down for cars, but please don't annoy the bicyclists when you do that. Yeah. You know, and one thing too is um, also for those roadways where you don't have sidewalks and you've got folks who are who are in um, either either wheelchairs or maybe have walkers or, or some other mobility um, impairment is, you know, I mean, having those bumps there and not having a way to, to get around them, it, it, it is you effectively know, a wall. It, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though it's only, you know, three or four inches tall, it's definitely, definitely a concern. And, and in fact, even, even for drivers sometimes, if, if folks have to go over those, I've known, I've, I've heard of folks who have like um, some conditions with um, neck issues mm -hmm. and they go over the bumps. Even if they're going at it at 15 miles an hour, that it, 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 mm -hmm. it causes pain discomfort on that. I'm kind of not a big fan of speed humps as being the first treatment. I, I kind of like the sidewalks. Drivers, right? But, but, you know, road rage. Was it? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it increases annoyance. You know, there's a, um, there's a thing on Kids Have County. They, um, at the small community of Hansville, apparently they put in some uh, speed tables on their uh, arterial roads mm -hmm. and going around there and they, what has happened is the community has been so divided that people now honk when they go over those speed humps oh. to go ahead and annoy the folks who punted them. <laughs> it, that's kind of, that's a very extreme example of that. It, it, if you go to beep, beep for bumps, there's an entire website devoted to this <laughs> location. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, there definitely is. People get very riled up. About speed, yeah. about speed. Because if you're annoyed after four bike humps and then you come across a bicyclist, um, hmm. You've mentioned speed tables, and I've seen a whole yeah. lot of different kinds of speed bumps and humps. Yeah. And there's there's just this big variety. I mean, is there, there must be a standard, you know, a city standard, <laughs> and, you know, a standard of where you put them, and a standard of height, and, mm -hmm. but, but it's not at all clear from sort of looking around what's been installed. Is it just, Looking at, at uh, you know historic speed bumps as well. You know I, now, um, if I'm, I'm I'm correct on this, the city of Seattle's typical one is, is 12 feet long, okay. um, and it's about it's I think it's at least three inches. It might be three and a half <laughs> <laughs> on height on that. Um, so and it never varies. That's what the standard is. The standard. The standard is the standard. Of course, speed humps are are. are are, are a tricky device to get to, to work from a construction perspective because it's asphalt and it moves. Um, it, it just you know, it's 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 kind of like liquid rocks. <laughs> um, so and and the, depending on the way that the contractor um, or crew makes makes the speed hump, it it can slightly vary on that. One of the ways that to go ahead and try and get around that is to is to create a, a template, just like either wood or a steel template, and then pretty much. Um, just dump the asphalt, and they just kind of push that thing all the way across uh, across the roadway, and to make it as consistent as it can be. So. What about the um, the rubber bolt down ones? Would that be way cheaper? And then you could put them down as sort of temporary to see see how they work, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, or would you have uh, people out there digging them up? Oh. <laughs> Honk if you like this. <laughs> I mean, is that a, a, a possibility for an inexpensive solution? Are they less expensive? It seems like they would be. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to, to remember what the, the costs of that. I, I can't remember off the top of my head how much those cost. But you're right. I mean, in fact, I think the first uh, speed cushions that Seattle did. Cushions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, That's what those rubber ones are called? The speed, so, so um, speed humps have different flavors. To say um, the speed typical one is, is just one that goes across the street about about 12 feet long, about three three and a half inches tall. Um, curve to curve, it actually attaches to the curb, or it some space some do, but oftentimes what they'll do is they'll taper it down, okay. and, and most of the reason for that is actually um, it is it's 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 drainage. Yeah, yeah. was it to let the oil get an impeded sound? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 drain it somewhere. So. Yeah, things have it. <laughs> so it does kind of taper down uh, on, the, on the sides there, um, but speed cushions uh, are ones that are, are cut in the middle oftentimes, and so what, what you'll see is you'll see those in between lanes where you have, typically on arterials is where you'll see those, um, 
on the um, for where buses are traveling or in particular fire response vehicles. Emergency vehicles don't really like the speed speed humps as much as possible. So that's why any routes which are an emergency response route um, vary. That was true up there near Safeway, right? I th that might have. I think they're wide enough to sit traffic that the emergency can get through without bumping, but the cars can't. Yes, exactly, because their their wheels are far apart that they can just drive over them and not worry about either. And, and I can cut through the middle of my bike too. Yeah, and that's kind of one of the things. If you have a big vehicle, you can make that. You can likely make that. Even I know in, in my Honda, I could partially. No, I was talking my bicycle, not my Hummer. <laughs> no, okay. Oh yeah, no, no, yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. Um, you can go ahead and just cut through them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they're cheap. What? Um, speed cushions. Speed cushions are definitely cheaper than uh, speed humps. What are your thoughts on rumble strips? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the intersection um, in particular, maybe in advance, the, or, or for a speed control. To uh, for uh, in, in advance of, a, uh, of an intersection. You know, actually, I do have a slide. Okay. Oh, yeah. um, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. I want to see the rest of your I wanted to talk yeah. science, actually, <laughs> before you leave this one. Sure. Um, yeah. I was on a bike centennial, you know, that the, the went across country. Yeah. And there's a section on Route 80 that, that, that you've got to be on Route 80. And there was like a 15 foot shoulder. They'd taken 12 feet of it for rumble strips. So I'm sort of Trump. tying this into that. And yeah. there was no other place for the bikes to be. And what I was thinking is okay, there's no other place for them to be. But could you please put a sign to the trucks doing 90? Bikes using highway for the next two miles. Bikes using highways for the next two miles. Bikes must exit. Is it, it's at least an education thing. If I wanted to sort of segue into the signs, but I think the signs and the education of that there's bikes using this heavily. You know, I know a lot of the uh, the interstate highway systems they they allow bikes to use the shoulder, but but yeah, there 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 isn't any sign of that. That's here, right. it's a little bit different. It was from. a cross frontal <laughs> bike tour marked, yeah. and they didn't even coordinate. So I think the signage could be huge there. I like that sign at the top. <laughs> May use full length. You know, it kind of gives the bikes permission instead of them being the assholes that are taking up the car lane. Well, that's, you know, and, and it's funny. The perception, even if it doesn't change the paint. Exactly. It kind of it gives that, that authority to it. And, and one thing, actually, I probably should, should have put in when they're talking about all this stuff is a lot of these slides are definitely going to be roadway focused. So um, I wanted to go ahead and say, did not forget about the pedestrian elements of this. A lot of the tools that, that we use to slow down cars and to get our motor vehicle volumes down or the crossing treatments help both modes. And so um, I, I definitely want to go ahead and make sure that um, make sure that we don't forget about the pedestrians on this. Oftentimes, um, you know, Seattle is known very great for a great pedestrian experience. Um, I know I walk all the time to downtown and around Capitol <coughs> So just to go ahead, I, Wanted to put that, that kind of that precursor in there, and I forgot to mention it in the beginning. Um, and one thing, too, actually, when kind of looking here, it's funny because I've only found two cities which actually call um, their neighborhood greenways neighborhood greenways. It seems that Portland and Seattle are the only ones that I've, that I've heard of so far, and that. And um, so when, when looking through all of this stuff, Bike Boulevard really was mm -hmm. the one, one thing which really bumped up. That's why. It, Pretty much all these signs say bike boulevard. Um, it wasn't a, a conscious mm -hmm. effort to look at this. It's a car turn, isn't it? Is it? I thought that in Portland, greenways were like just bicycle and pedestrian paths, and bike boulevards were shared with cars. Isn't that how their language goes? Or From is it different? what I know of the history, and Kathy, let me know on what, what you know on that, is that they, they've, they've renamed bike boulevards as pretty much neighborhood oh. greenways. Mm. Um, to I think I think part of it was to encompass the, the pedestrian in, in, in the neighborhoods. That's that's my yeah. understanding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just felt the, the greenway was the path along the river, and then the, the other ones. But I you yeah. know, I haven't been down there a lot in the past couple of years, so if there's a recent change, then I, I think I think, I think it happened maybe. I mean, it's mm -hmm. really recent. I mm -hmm. think maybe like yeah. a year. Or yeah, so. that maybe three or four years. And so, um, a, a lot of folks are still calling it the Greenways. Yes. Uh, on this topic, um, yeah. there's been some discussion on the, the CERB lately about the difference between a green street and a greenway. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could 
describe the um, My understanding of the Green Street is that it's uh, more of an environmental um, treatment of drainage facilities. Um, so using natural drainage, uh, like um, rain gardens. Stormwater. Stormwater. Definitely very stormwater based and stormwater. Really great marriage, though. What's that? A really great marriage. They have a green screen and a green life mm -hmm. all together. I mean, that would be really good. Yeah. I, I, I agree, yeah, because I mean, a lot of the treatments that they use for green streets are um, are very applicable to uh, to greenways. The bulb outs, the narrowing of the roadway, kind of the reclaiming of space, putting in trees and, 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 and vegetation. So, I, I mean, you know, it's funny because if you, it, it's funny how we got to this point because, you know, I remember when I started and I got out of school, um, I was working as an intern and we were talking about neighborhood traffic calming, what it was. And then it started to, to move into more, we started talking about green infrastructure and, and livable streets. And it's almost like we're moving towards these. Now, all these tools that we've had, which individually were very difficult to, you know, were all very hard fights for various reasons, either institutionally or, or, or culturally. They've all kind of added up into this moment. So now suddenly we're seeing neighborhood greenways, bike boulevards, or what, what you know. I like using neighborhood greenways because I think it's much more inclusive. Uh, not just because I'm presenting for Seattle neighborhood greenways, but. Uh, so, so, yeah. So we went ahead and just kind of threw up some signs here. These are some examples of signs. I only found a little sign there for speed limit 35. I sure hope we don't ever have <laughs> speed limit 35 on our residential streets. Um, but I did like the dry friendly. That's the bicycle speed limit. <laughs> as fast as you can go. Uh, this is the upper one, the bicycle boulevard, bikes may use full lane sign. That's actually from Madison, Wisconsin. They're starting their uh, I think they've got two full ones right now. And so they use these signs here. I like it because it says, you know, it says the name up there. So maybe, you know, you change it to neighbor Greenway. Bikes may use full lane to just give that, that sense of, yes, you belong here. I love the graphic with the kid because it just, you know, people are taking more care of their children now than ever. I hope. I would hope. And it personalizes it. Personal. It personalizes You know, it's funny, that, that sign, the, the bikes may use full lane sign. There's actually just with the regular bike symbol is actually the official sign from the MUTCD. So they've, they've modified this, and I, I think that for, for a greenway, I think that it looks great. So, so um, I have a question. So with our like the signed routes, we, we have like the little green and white signs, right? Which nobody notices when they're driving a car, <laughs> right? They're not for cars. But here, they're actually designing signage for cars. Do you know if the city of Seattle is doing anything for neighborhood greenways where they're signing it <coughs> such that a car would notice the sign and receive the information? I think that most of it are relying on share on that, but um, I, I don't know. OK. So, yeah, I, th I think share is kind of what they're keeping that emphasis of bikes, bikes are, are here. But, you know, I, I can't speak for Seattle, but that, that's my, my um, thinking out loud. Okay. And then, and then there's some other signs like uh, Bike Boulevard, Fourth Avenue. This is out of Arizona, down there, and they just these are kind of identification signs. And then some just directional signs out there. One thing which is really nice in the new MUTCD is that speed limit signs now they allow a, um, a, a sign that you put on top of them. For example, one of the examples is neighborhood. So you can put a little sign on top of that would say neighborhood speed limit 25 or neighborhood speed limit 20 on that. Um, similar to what they do with schools, so how they got school speed limit 20. Uh, so they do not have neighborhood greenway, although I think that was, that was definitely before that was that, it, that neighborhood greenway is capped. So that may be an alternative to go ahead and do something. I went ahead and threw up some pavement markings to try and, uh, you know, we've got the Wallingford ladybug up there. And then to decorate crosswalks. And this is the idea to, to also, another visual cue to drivers to say, this is a different street. This is a different, a different way. Um, I've come around on, in, on, on painted intersections. At first I thought they were going to be a distraction, but I think 
over time, what's happened is is that they they really give a neighborhood identity and um, and, and uh, a, a visual cue to say these are different. This is a different street. I wanted to make one comment about the painted streets as I was I was on the phone yesterday, I guess, with Greg Raisman in Portland and say, he said paint on the street is great, it's fun. They do a lot with a group called City Repair in Portland. Yeah. And he said doesn't do a thing for slowing the traffic. So just to sort of be aware of that. That, that would make sense, yeah. Yeah, so you know, I don't even know if that's proof shadows. So it would be something to think about. You know, sometimes it's all about the, the, the urban legend that they did, early on that they did. I can tell you some history about that. Um, oh. I've done a lot of work down in Portland with City Repair. And mm -hmm. um, originally, they, they kind of uh, promoted them as a traffic calming device. And um, part of the, the official position in Portland now by the, the PDOT is that they don't promote them as traffic calming device partly because they don't want them limited by the universal traffic code, um, whatever the restrictions are. About, yeah. you know, it has to be exactly like this. They want the room for creativity. Mm -hmm. And the way, the way that it, it's kind of a secondary traffic kind of thing, wherein when you create more activity on the street and more interest and more unusual things going on, then people slow down because they're like, what's going on? <laughs> and it's like, this is, like you said, this, yeah. is, this is not like other streets. There's something, there's something Potentially, that I have to pay attention to, and that's you know that's what makes people slow down. And so they, they don't promote it as a traffic calming device, um, partly because it isn't really substantiated by the numbers necessarily, and because they don't want it universalized in such a way that it takes away the, the ability to be flexible and creative. With it. So and as, as there's a difference <laughs> and it stops being different, does that effect go away? Well, part of it, I think, what they do down in Portland is. There'll be an intersection painting, but there'll also be a lot of other things going on on the block. You know, people will they'll build little sharing stations on the corners, and they'll have you know benches and info kiosks and cob ovens and, and just kind of neighborhood activity and things going on. So these become gathering places. Whereas the way we've done them in Seattle so far, it's just a painting on the street, mm -hmm. right? So in we Portland, it's like this is the this is the <laughs> indicator that something's going on here, and no one. So you put the something's going on here sign in Seattle, but there's not really anything going on there. <laughs> so they go, oh, something's going on here, and then after going through the intersection ten times, they're like, well, no, not actually. So off they go. <laughs> <laughs> you know? so it sounds like you're saying it kind of works then when when that is when the intersection painting is part of how part of changing how a street or a place is being used. Yes. So yes. If, it's, if if it is a community building thing that is part of change. Right. Great. But that's right. actually the primary. Right. But that's it's about building community in your neighborhood and, and connecting street people life. to each other mm -hmm. and creating street life. And yeah. when you create street life, that slows down the traffic because there's more different sorts of people doing more different sorts of things there. Right. So, yeah. I've also read a couple, <laughs> a couple studies that have said, um, have looked at that over time. And when it first goes down, there is that uh, sort of alertness that people get mm -hmm. because it is something new. But it does, over time, people get used to it. Sure. That's when they mm -hmm. start right. to turn to their older habits. It's only novel until it's not. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But I think it's part of a, a larger change for that one. That would, you know, I, I haven't seen reports that look exactly at that, but I, yeah. I, I suspect that your mm -hmm. yeah. observations it, There's that element, smaller. like the speed humps, too. There's the people who like speed because they're mad, you know. They make more noise and they make more <laughs> <laughs> between things because they're like, yeah. So there's, they had problems with the actually the first intersection thing it was in an intersection that's kind of on the way to some other kind of separate kind of enclave sort of neighborhood and the people who were going there who were coming through here were hmm. very un unhappy about it and this was a lot of unneighborly behavior going on that way hmm. and it took a lot of community building and reaching out to the particular thing and some changes of the design to kind of mitigate that neighborhood rivalry thing, <laughs> territory. It was like the old block level neighborhood gang behavior going on. <laughs> 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 what kind of changes they were? What? Well, like the original painting was a lot bigger and more colorful. And one of the things that they did in the second and third iterations is they, they kind of made it a little more sophisticated. They did the, the perimeter in um, 
it look, made it look like brickwork by using like stamp pattern like sponges so that so that it looked like a. Is that at Sherrod Square? Yes, it's at uh, Sherrod Square. So they, they 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 became a little less radical in their design in order to be more friendly for neighbors. <laughs> What's the price on the project of that? Depends. Depends on depends what you on, do. Yeah, it depends on what. Kids and some paintbrushes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you, if you come out with your neighbors and your and your you know excess. Own, Home paint. Oh, yeah, home paint or whatever. <laughs> Here in Seattle, we have restrictions about you have to use a certain kind of paint and you have to get a certain sort of permitting. And I'm trying to think, what did we spend on any of I'm trying to remember, too. Is it a couple thousand? It's or like, it yeah, it's a couple thousand, thousand probably by the time you buy paint and materials. Were you involved in the one in one street We were involved in the one at 80th and 81st. I'm bringing these up. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just curious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can talk afterwards. Yeah, okay. I'll hear more about mm -hmm. that. So. That was good. Already, already started. I actually hit the button there. Um, oh, <laughs> oh, and also one thing. I know this is this is uh, pavement, the pavement quality. And in particular, when I put this slide together, I was thinking about Federal Avenue yeah, over here. Federal um, Avenue. Oof, that's a that's a bumpy road. And you know, in, mo in most residential streets in Seattle, I know, are just they're just in horrible shape, and if you look at it, they're never gonna, you know, it, unless we get some massive infusion of, of capital, it's gonna be kind of rough. But if federal were the greenway, it right? Would get it would get smoothed out. It would actually feel like you're going down. <laughs> nice, and, it's, and so I put together just kind of some slides, uh, just just kind of different pavement options. And one, of course, the one is like the full rebuild with concrete, which is incredibly pricey. Um, also because um, it would require all various different upgrades for at intersections for new ADA ramps and, um, and other things. So it would it, it starts to encompass a, a larger, it becomes a much larger project. By the way, I don't want to say that ADA ramps are bad. <laughs> I enjoy ADA ramps, I think they're great. Um, it just, it just, just saying it's a bit there. It's cost. And the other one is just a pavement of just the center. You can see that the parking lanes aren't Aren't paved, but the center one, the center is, and then the the lower one here is actually this is a treatment they did. This is again in, in Arizona and Tucson. What they did was they they just did a three foot stretch here. This section in particular was really bad pavement. Um, they did a three foot section both directions. They went through, I think, and for about three blocks, it was only something like I think twenty thousand dollars or something like that. And so they just kind of went down and. I think they called it a zipper. Was what they what they, what they called? Was it? Cut it out and put it back down. Yeah, pretty. Yeah, pretty much. It just yeah, pavement came up and they, they they put it back there. And then they're using the bike dots here. You can kind of see. Um, this is kind of a, a, a high traffic area, but this was the worst part of the pavement that they did. And this might be an option for something on on some of the neighborhood streets, just running to, you know, running one in each direction. So. Yeah, that's my my experience with riding. Is that the worst section of the street is the bike lane? There's yeah. these mm -hmm. huge voids and chips. <laughs> you know, the pavement will just disappear, and, and you're like you're always swerving out to get around all this mess. It's like, you know. it and then they repave, the <laughs> they repave, and they repave like over to the middle of the bike lane, so you're falling off the edges. It's just yeah. ridiculous. And given some of the and given some of the narrow streets through some of the neighborhoods where you do at some point have to go over to the curb to let people pass, mm -hmm. and that to to only pave the middle and leave the parking lane as un unimproved pavement means you're kind of going over that edge mm -hmm. yeah, back and forth all the time. Bike so bike. I can see places where that would work, but I think a lot of the narrow streets we're talking about, that might be a problem. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good point. It's these small details. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the one you're showing there at the bottom, is, are you showing it just to share it, or is Seattle, do you know Seattle's thinking? Because I mean, I can see this on tons of residential streets, just yeah. making it an instantly beautiful way to bike through a street going on the note that potholes and so down. You know, I, I haven't heard if Seattle is looking at this treatment. Um, this is uh, definitely a guy that uh, it is definitely the share and so with some other what other cities are are, are tackling kind of that are also with limited resources as well. Um, I, I know that that was a really big concern for them. With a lot of these treatments you're suggesting, I mean I'm sure that things are limited to by your you know, NACJO or your MUCTV guides or whatever, that, you know, 
maybe zippers aren't allowed in Seattle because of some guides that were following. And you know, I, I have no idea what those are. You know, I definitely, um, I, I know this treatment in particular, this isn't prohibited by the uh, METCD or, or any, um, any national guidelines that I know of. Um, I'm not sure about Seattle, if Seattle has a regulation or anything on that one. I may look at the yeah. office. So yeah, we, uh, our budget is about $150,000 per mile, put it anyway. So uh, if you think about uh, what that would cost, it's not very much. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one particular section, if we see a really bad pavement, uh, we'll go ahead and do repairs on that one or two panels. But if we have a significant deterioration, then you know, we can't you afford to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one street we actually will be uh, uh, filling just like that, just on the bicycle uh, facility. We want, we want that bicycle facility to be uh, smooth and uh, uh, rideable. Uh, but a lot of locations, you know, we're concentrating all of our resources at the intersection crossing right. where the bulk of the safety concerns are. One of the things that you sort of mentioned with all the, the stuff, um, some of these things tend to accumulate all the the gravel that the cars blow off, yeah. so it actually becomes worse. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, I know on residential streets, because like, I know it's great to have cars sweep it every once in a while. I know bike lanes in particular. You know, all the all the debris that's where they all end up being. You know, mm -hmm. um, I know at least at some on some residential streets, at least if it's in the middle, sometimes you could just go ahead and choose to. And now I just gotta go ahead and talk about some uh, local intersections here, um, kind of the, the traffic control. On this. Now we've kind of moved into what to do with the intersections here. Uh, you know, this is kind of the, the level of, of local intersection control. You know, moving from no control to yield to stop. You know, one of the things that en engineers like to do is not to throw everything at the wall for the first for the first gamut of it because. We like to have the option of, well, if it doesn't work, we still have this else in our pocket. Um, because if we throw everything at the wall and then it doesn't work, we're kind of left with, well, what else do we have type of thing. So a lot of times, you know, you'll see kind of the buildup of, of control uh, levels. And so one of the things to talk about is, you know, how, how do we decide where to put some of this stuff? This is just kind of a general conversation. This is in particular in regards to bike waste, but it, it kind of has some, some um, effect on them. So a lot of times it's uh, some sight distance concerns. If you can come into an intersection at, at a certain speed and be able to see a car or a bike or a pedestrian coming at a certain, at a certain speed, you can make that decision. And, now, uh, the yield sign is oftentimes about that. That is about 10 miles an hour. You can see and, and react fast enough, then that's where a yield sign is oftentimes put. And then, if it's less, a stop sign is oftentimes uh, useful. One of the other responses is collisions. Um, again, I hate. To, I always hate to talk about collisions being a requirement because then that just kind of reinforces the uh, the the belief that we don't do anything until someone dies, <laughs> you know, and I, 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 it, I think it's a, it's a reasonable criticism a lot of times because that's oftentimes what people see. They see these high-profile actions, and then something happens because of, because of a, a really bad accident, a bad collision, or, or something like that. Um, but sometimes there are conditions in which um, you can go out to a, a location and you don't, you, you see the sight distance is good traffic conditions or, or such that it's very difficult to, to see what might what might be happening and sometimes collisions are the only story necessarily there um, some recent research actually about a couple years old out of Kentucky showed that um, they compared uh, bike safety bike and pedestrian safety at uh, intersections with no control and stop control to kind of see where is the severity of it and they found that if you went ahead and you put in a stop control that you had a reduction of it really about 18% Injury accidents. So, um, so things like that. Also, um, other things to consider are volumes of, of bikes and pedestrians. One thing what happens is is that drivers are a very wily, wily bunch, and they will figure out where where maybe they don't have to stop 100% of the time. And so, if uh, 
uh, off the <coughs> what happens, so it's hard to stop a, a higher volume roadway for a lower volume roadway. So what happens is that what we often have to do is is get um, more bikes and pedestrians using that road. So it's almost kind of like a chicken and the egg type of debate. So I, I'm kind of a really big fan of, of, of putting stop signs on on, on freeways to try and to try and encourage that safety. Yeah. So this is a conundrum for me, or I'm kind of wondering. So I live between 80th and 85th. And I live between I-5 and Aurora. And between those two, there's one stop, or one traffic control light, because 85th and 80th are busy streets, and particularly at rush hour, but throughout the day. Yeah. There's, and there's hills, so that makes visibility hard. So um, there's Wallingford has a traffic light. That's the traffic light in between these two major thoroughfares, Aurora and I-5. And Wallingford itself is, there's two buses that go down Wallingford. It's a narrow street and it's got parking on one side. I think it's got, does it have parking on one side? Maybe it's not, it's narrow in any case. Uh, maybe it doesn't have parking. Yeah, it seems like it does. Anyway. Yeah, I think it is, I think, I think it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, I've got those big particular buses. Yeah, yeah, well, yes. And so yeah. it's not a street you would want to take a bike down. And. So between, so 82nd to 85th is a long gap, you know, a long stretch long that, you, yeah, it's a long block. And then crossing it, because I'm like thinking, I think it would be great to have North Seattle Community College and Green Lake connected. I mean, the, the lake yeah. itself. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to figure out how that would happen. Now I know on 80th, on the other side of Aurora, east, east of Aurora, or west of Aurora, mm -hmm. There was two traffic lights recently put in. There's one already at Linden. And they put another one at uh, like Fremont. Fremont is the bikeway north. And north. then there's another traffic light. There's like two traffic lights like within a block of each other. That well, was done in the last couple. Station. Is there a fire station there? No. Because was, was it, was it like, I think, because if you're one you're talking about, I think this is one that we're all going to say, the like Fremont Avenue, they have mm -hmm. one. And then there's another one, which is yeah. right. No, it's yeah, right. but what I'm saying yeah. is there's no good way for a bike to safely get across unless you go down to Wallingford, which itself is not a safe right. bike route, especially between 80th and 85th. And then when you cross 85th on Wallingford, you're still on a really busy thoroughfare that I mean, I think the next block up. I mean, there's a way yeah. to do it if there were two traffic lights installed, one on 80th and one on 85th. There's like flatter routes, mm -hmm. there's wider roads, There's there would be some good bikeways. Mm -hmm. I have a few different ideas in mind, but it would require two traffic lights. Right. Is, and is so I'm kind of wondering, is that even an option? Does that fit in the budget? Traffic signal is probably the, the budget right there for a mile, so mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, the, those budget issues for the uh, for yeah. signals are pretty crazy. I mean, they, yeah. I think um, like 150 probably on the low end. So Very low end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to like 250,000. I mean, they already Talking about streets, as I think it's in your your neighborhood. They're actually using some alleys for some of them. Yeah, there's not there's, any alleys. There's some trails I've been through that have turned me down an alley. It's like great. <gasps> no, no traffic. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a public street, isn't it? Or is it is so he, public right away? Means when, uh, what is that, south of Lake Washington? The, yeah, yeah, south of Lake Washington. Like Washington. Like, where Hamlin oh, yeah. cuts through? Yeah, Shelby Hamlin. Yeah. 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 I don't know if it is now. I wonder if there's any alleys. Like <laughs> 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 that doesn't solve yeah. the getting across That's, the intersection. Yeah, that doesn't solve the intersection. We're talking about getting across 80th and getting across 85th to go from North Seattle down the lake. And, and some, and some, you know, the, those type of conditions, those arterial crossings. I mean, those are, those are where the real costs of of, um, of greenways. Comes right, in. but I'm wondering, like, yeah. how is it that those lights got put on 80th, and there were like two of them close to each other, kind of excess, and one that you said was a greenway. One so is, is how did that get funded? A bike route. But the other one on Dayton, they did a bunch of, of pedestrian type work on Dayton. 
Yeah, I think I did. It's been years. Huh? I mean, that's. I think it was before I was. I was here. That's so that's about at least six okay. years ago. Let's talk. Right. So, um, but you know, sometimes you you get to um, you know we put in a stop sign, and sometimes like that incident that occurred in Portland, in which um, in which, in which uh, the woman was was hit by a car, which just ran the stop sign. Sometimes people don't stop. Um, engineering wise, it's very difficult to try and, and stop people from doing behavior other than doing things like, even even at intersections, to make the sight distance better, so that, for example, if you're on a bike and you see, you know, you see a car and you're like, wait a minute, that car is, he's not going to stop. I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, put on the brakes. And, I'm going to yield, even though I don't have to. Right. Because you know, it'll hurt. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, and run, it's not really helpful. Yeah. And, 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 and we probably I'm all have those stories, you know, <laughs> either, either if we're pedestrian or we're bicyclist where we're just driving which someone just blows through a red light and we just you, you know it's just lucky that we weren't at that point of, it, of, of where he, they went by. Yeah. Is this a possibility for um, Greenway Crossing so instead of saying cross traffic doesn't stop like neighborhood Greenway Crossing underneath a stop sign or something similar so that people know they're crossing the Greenway like really know? You know and oftentimes um, and, and this kind of comes down to um, Kind of throwing everything at the wall necessarily. Um, I, I I do think that when when you add could add a stop sign uh, where there was none because again we all kind of throw that we drive through the same places every day or we ride through the same intersections every day and we and we walk through the same and, and we kind of go on autopilot and we just don't see mm -hmm. things that change and and that's um, I, I this is a treatment to definitely to go ahead and to make it more visible and to let them not only know but Stop. Okay, cross traffic also. Right, and stop. you could have the graphic on it, the you know neighborhood greenway crossing, so that people know because this is going to be a whole new thing, and people aren't going to know what it is unless we do a major ad campaign to go with it. And so, I mean, I think something too. One of the things that I think was a really good thing that uh, that Portland and India and Madison I know has done is um, those street name signs that mm -hmm. kind of so it's on top of this sign. Unfortunately, I didn't get a, a photo of that. Just something like that shows something's different. Almost like kind of the like the going yeah. greenway or something. Was it the going greenway like right. Portland or something? Mm -hmm. exactly. I, I just feel yeah. like uh, for greenway crossings, we need to have something that's different, <clears throat> like that maybe on top the name of the the greenway. But you know, you are now crossing the greenway. Look for <laughs> children. Have you learned anything good about the, what comes to mind as the Burke Gilbert with all those ones coming off the hill there? The fluorescent yellow and green ones look those? nice. They <coughs> seem to work. The other ones work less nice, I think. Personally. I mean, there's people coming off of a steep hill. Yeah. So, so you've got to learn something either positive or negative from that. And, yeah. and at least with the, you know, at least with the stop sign, I know because some of those crossings, um, with with this, this at least, you know, if, if oftentimes we'll probably not want to do a, a warning of the crossing just before because the stop sign should take. That precedence and be like, um, you know, that, that's kind of I, I, I know, <laughs> but um, that's kind of you know this is the sign to pay attention to. This is this is the stop sign. Um, one thing uh, just to, to say is maybe that um, you know we want people to stop at all stop signs and regardless of whether or not it's a it's a it's a it's a green one or not. We definitely want you to stop stop here. Just to, to look at that as advocate type of way. I'd be like. But I do, I do see the concern, and definitely, and I think probably when, if any changes go on, is that there definitely should be a, uh, you know, a way to call the alert. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. I just wanted to say that, um, so we have a fair amount of bad driving behavior in my neighborhood, and people treat both of the big stop sign intersections as sort of as optional, <laughs> and um, I just call and complain these pretty sick all yeah. the time. And then they have somebody yeah. sit there and give out tickets for a while. Oh, really? and, and I don't know if it changes behavior, but I suspect it does a little. You know, enforcement. Infor you know, enforcement has a great short term. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard that, you know, that 1 800 call in somebody that's in the HOV lane illegally. Uh -huh. They take the number and they don't do anything with it. No, you know, but I, see, I see the crews are sitting there. Really? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> It is kind of good to see, you know, you're like, I go through this intersection all the time, and you know, you blow through that intersection all the time. Yeah. Well, what you should know? you do? Back them and stop them. 
Oh, I do. Good. Yeah. Hi. Give yeah. them a little. Because they're, they're, they're getting ragged off and the people are getting tickets. Make sure they get their bags. Good question. Yeah. Well, what about combining uh, stop signs with other traffic coming elements like uh, speed cushions, for example? So you're slowing the like traffic. Like at the intersection or exactly. slowing the intersection? Or exactly. Like, uh, so on the approach to the stop sign, you're already slowing the traffic. Does that encourage them to obey the signs even more? Is that sort of like the nuclear option? You know, I was I was looking for um, some studies on, on, on the ways that if you were to slow traffic down, do they have more of a propensity to stop at the stop sign? I couldn't find them. Doesn't mean they don't exist. <laughs> um, but when I was so, but that does, that does bring up something is that maybe um, looking on the side streets, if if to go ahead and slow cars down, not only looking at the greenway. But also kind of looking at those streets entering into the green line. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they, they, okay. Yeah, it seems For to make a sense. lot of us, that's the bigger concern. It's not necessarily people driving fast along the greenway. It's all the intersections it's and crossing it. <laughs> so, so, yeah, maybe, maybe that's yeah. maybe that's the trade off. Yeah. Um, and is so, rotating stop signs a big deal here? I don't. I, I don't know about that. <laughs> stop signs to rotate. What are so rotating yeah, stuff? Changing, turning, changing, 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 changing,
on, on this location here. This is actually the, this is the sign on the side street. Um, it shows the bike boulevard. It, this is actually this is actually in the circle itself, um, but it shows the direction that they need to go. That the bikes are that the bikes will be at. So it's almost kind of it, it's 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 kind of a combination of a guide sign, but also also like this implicit <coughs> warning for motorists and traffic circles, which I thought was really kind of interesting. Also, the, the keep right sign over there to kind of encourage drivers to go to the right instead of instead of doing the mm -hmm. Seattle and through left. So this, this makes me think about what has just gone in, in Wallingford with the, with the six um, turnings. <laughs> and I'm just wondering what your, your opinion is of that. I mean, you know, if, it, if it works, it works. I'm just kind of, as an engineer. You know, I, I, I think it's an interesting application. And, um, you know, Can you explain what it is? Uh, so so what, what they've done in Wallingford and, and I, was, I went through it last night, so uh, <laughs> so um, well, yeah. It's, it's, so it's a circle, and then um, so when you come in, there's there's shadows on it to direct a motorist to go, or a motorist or a cyclist to go around because it's at a location. Or you turn across yeah. out. Yeah. Okay. Good. Then. <laughs> So I'm not going to even try to, to draw a bike. There's six of them. Is there also a, is this something else, the one here? Yeah. Is that when you do the zigzag? No, that's just when you turn. Is that the, right, is this, this is the one we're talking about? Yeah. So, uh, is it to move it, move from 43rd to 42nd, or 44th to 42nd? It's, it's going to be the left turn. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's what I'm Yeah, because the, right. yeah. so the bike route is going mm -hmm. this way. Hmm. To this street. There's six more in the next intersection, too. The line you just drew, that would be a useful thing to have on the street. Not so long you need it. So, so, yeah, you know, I, you know I'm actually kind of curious. There you go. Maybe if there's any um, kind of side benefits, yeah. making sure that people go that way. That's true. Um, so, yeah. Is anyone know, was there a before or after the study? We did, we did on neighborhood. The people on the neighborhood. So, so you have a record of like at that intersection, how yes. many people went cut it to yes. the left? we do. Oh, we should do an after study then. We do. Yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> that would be really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Glad we did that. That would be really neat to see what comes out of that. As an engineer, I'm always looking for more data. Especially the before. Right. Yeah. Before and after, I, I tell you, it's, it's kind of really sad. I always feel sometimes like when people ask me stuff, it's like, well, what's the data? <laughs> and like, well, we don't have data. We just need opinion. It's like, well, I can't really give me an opinion. I need data. <laughs> um, here's actually an interesting uh, island crossing treatment. Um, and, uh, some of the, I know in Wallingford they did the island crossing here, but this is one which allows a, um, a cyclist. The problem with this one is that if there's not really a facilitating of a pedestrian here, that's that is a, it's a real drawback on this. Um, you can see that there are sidewalks somewhat that lead up to this intersection. So, to, and there's not even a marked crosswalk here, which is a very, it's not a, a great option. Um, before this intersection, there is a warning sign which does show a pedestrian and a bicycle symbol. Um, it's slightly different than the one that's here. It's mm -hmm. pedestrians on top, the bikes below. Um, but there's not really a pedestrian crossing here. So that, that's the trade-off. But it does allow that access mm -hmm. issue without allowing traffic to go through. So you've got the side street on the bike, on, on the neighbor greenway, which has to take the right turn. So it doesn't, it can't continue through. And then you've got, but the cyclists can, also you could have vehicles which turn in left on either side. So it it doesn't make it a full closure necessarily, but it, it does, so it might be something depending to be able to treat some movements. if you. Certain movements have to be accommodated. They could go ahead and do this. So, okay, I'm just gonna I'm gonna go and kind of geek out real fast on this one here. And I know we're kind of running late on time, <laughs> but I love offset interceptions. I'm just going to tell you these are like incredibly challenging and fun. <laughs> um, one, um, actually, a paper I 
published was talking about offset crossings. And so one thing that I've, I've started to look at is to go ahead and see the paper was really kind of a summary of what was out there at the time. And there was not a lot of stuff out there. So this is, a, this is down in Portland up here at 41st and Stark. And what they had is the greenways down back here and then over here. And so a cyclist comes in, turns here, and then turns back. Um, this is kind of a nice little option. The vehicle count on this is about 10,000 cars a day, so it's only probably about 1,000 vehicles during the peak hour. Because in comparison, the one down here, this is a this is a side path. Again, the one leg of the offset intersection is down here, so they would have to turn up here. This is a color different. It's a it's kind of a pink color. Comes through here, goes to a signal, and then crosses here across the street there, that the vehicles which are traveling there, that's about 40,000 vehicles a day. So um, you can see that's kind of orders of magnitude higher. So. Could you explain what an offset intersection is? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so when you have, actually, I think the next slide actually kind of shows this probably a little bit better. There you go. So I should have put this one first. Uh, so if you have like a street which is here and then here on the greenway, and oftentimes, you know, the unfortunate, one of the ways that I think back when they were designing subdivisions were to try and prevent vehicles from making continuing through a neighborhood was to offset these. Now when we're coming back and we're trying to implement these low stress treatments, we now run into these barriers. Um, so that's a, that's that would be that's a good visual of so the you offset. Like, you like them because they're like, why do you like them? I just love them because they're challenging as an engineer. I mean, <laughs> as a cyclist, the probably, you know, a cyclist or a pedestrian, I wouldn't ask them to deal with for a greenway. They're not, they're not the best, but, but they're the reality that we have to deal with a lot of times. And uh, so just to kind of go back real fast, um, th these are two treatments here, and then there's two more. Um, so if you have like a low, a low, relatively speaking, volume arterial, you can go ahead and Maybe a striped bike lane is the best. These are obviously very cheap, um, and this cheapest of the options. But if you have something with a high amount of vehicles, and, and this one in particular has a divided roadway with a left turn lane, um, to ask someone to go into traffic, cross two lanes, get into a left turn lane, and then cross two more lanes of traffic to get onto the neighborhood street is probably is, is very, very like, big ask. Exactly. We totally lose the whole thing, and suddenly this becomes its own barrier. As you know, because you, you see my offset intersection on Madison. Yeah. Um, one thing I wonder about with the offset intersection is I feel very nervous hanging out in the middle of the road with traffic going both directions, speeding by in both directions. I just don't feel no stress there. Um, yeah. and also, when it's raining and like at dusk and stuff like that, you have a lot of re reflectivity of lights off the surface. That's a good point. So I don't know if those, if the painted lines would even be seen in, in those conditions. Good evening. The Capitol Hill Library will close in 30 minutes at 8 o'clock. If you need to get a library card today, you have to check out. <laughs> yeah, you would have to be packed up and gone by 7.45. Okay, yeah. yeah that, that's what the I The top machine computer station will shut down in five minutes to the hour. <laughs> I just talk over if you want to do something. Yeah. To address the previous speaker's concern, there's been three additional treatments that help address that. One is just to paint the entire thing green, the bright bike green. So it's known to be a bike safe place in the middle of the street. The other is to add a buffered space on the side of like, so it's like a you know, buffered bike lane, so there'd be buffered space. And the third is actually just to have a physical barrier so it feels like there's a phys it may not actually be all that much. It could just be one like a treatment on the ground, but um, it's enough to make people feel safe with yeah. the space. If it's something that'll hurt somebody's car, I'll feel safe. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. With, like this that's well, is that a painted treatment or is that a interesting on this treatment, treatment here? <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Um, th this yeah, this is a this is a median treatment in which pretty much you make this into an island almost yeah. and then you just come across and turn here. This could also, and this even works for pedestrians very well because now you, you can do that two stage crossing. You know, cross two lanes, stop, go across. 
Um, I was actually looking for a photo on this. This was out of Columbia, Missouri. Um, so they only have the concept right now. I'm really curious to see what it actually looks like and if those are paint or if those are barrier posts or what are those. Because I think, like you were saying, Bob, right. and, uh, what you are saying is that that concrete barrier is, is really is really beneficial. Right. And yeah. then the but, one of two is, sorry. Uh, one thing too is to go ahead the uh, offset uh, uh, intersections to have a um, kind of a refuge where someone could go ahead and turn, get to uh, get to like a bike box or like the left turning bike box, wait there, wait for a gap in traffic and go across. This would be probably like a, a low volume street, but you still get the little less stress because you're not in the middle of the road. So some really quick things here. Um, signals are kind of the um, are, are the um, the top end of the crossings at arterials. Here we've got our Seattle half signal, standard signal. This is actually a Fremont at 85th here. And then um, a couple others. One is called a toucan. Uh, this is actually, it forces vehicles to take a right-hand turn, but bikes and pedestrians can go all the way through. They developed this, the name came from two modes can cross. <laughs> Tucson also, this, is actually, this actually came out of Tucson, although I think Tucson coined the name, but I think this had actually been in some some phase of it had been in existence since I think Paulo Paulo the first the first right turn was it? Was so the, they they just do uh, islands here, so it, it forces a vehicle to take a right turn. Vehicles can still turn in though from from the main street. And then the other one on the other side is what they call the bike clock. Um, I've got another slide down here as well. This kind of shows how this how this operates. It's pretty much it's dark, and then someone comes up, pushes a button, it goes flashy yellow, then a steady yellow, and then a steady red on both of them. So it kind of looks like a Mickey Mouse head. And then during the pedestrian, when because it's, it, it was developed for pedestrians, it wasn't developed originally for bikes. And so what has happened is, and I'll show in the next slide, kind of how how it's been modified. And I think what that is, is that it's very applicable to what Seattle has with their half signals. Um, it's the same situation, the only difference is that the signal heads are different. Um, but then during, when the pedestrian flashing hand is on, it goes to a flashing red, like a railroad crossing, meaning that if, a, if it's clear, the motor vehicle traffic can continue. And then after that, it goes back to dark. So this is just kind of to show that what, what what it looks like. Um, a cyclist, um, the pedestrian, would have no problem because they come up here, they push the push button, they cross. It's great. Just like a half second. Uh The bicyclist, though, has to get off, off their bike, push the push button. We have a nice sign there that says use, bike, use pet signal. And then what they did was they actually painted, uh, painted a four foot stripe on each side, painted it green. The middle side is six foot wide, but um, you know, obviously, both bikes and pets can use the whole space. There's no limit on that, but it does kind of show that difference. And I'd be curious to see what the response is on drivers. This is a relatively new installation, uh, so to see what the drivers are doing, if it's more visible because of that green making the crosswalk kind of pop out. And then there's just the sign that says saying crosswalk it has a little bike symbol and then a little pet symbol. Where is this? This is down in Tucson. So. So. Here's some, some of the sig uh, signals real fast. Um, MUTCD has a lot of requirements for signals. A lot of times, bikes simply just can't. I mean, with the volumes, it's kind of one of those cases, again, the chicken and the egg. Well, we don't have a lot of bikes crossing this road, or we don't have a lot of pedestrians crossing this road, because it's four lanes and it's high, high traffic. So it doesn't get, it doesn't form a signal. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, we don't have a lot of chickens crossing the road. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, so it's kind of the reality, you know, that reality of you need signals to get those volumes up sometimes. Um, they can increase cut through traffic because now cars can make that crossing. Um, detection, that's just a, a signal um, that's designed, but the costs are actually pretty high. Um, you know, a standard signal, 150 to 250,000 bucks. It's a lot of money for a great way. Um, the bike hawk signal is about 100 to 150,000. So it's slightly cheaper, but still 
and still you're it's a pretty pretty good commitment on that these are just some active devices a lot of these we have in Seattle um, just kind of pushing push buttons and flashing little lights um, this was actually a treatment that they did in Boulder uh, I thought it was kind of cool um, they force everyone to take a right turn and but what happens if you notice here the cyclist and the cyclist can come here there's a little loop detector there so it goes there, it waits for a gap, and then these flashing lights start to flash. The great thing about this is that so you've taken care of your bike detection, but also on the side, you still have push buttons for the pedestrians. So you kind of get both modes on this. Um, I just abbreviated this, the RRFB stands for Rapid Rectangular Flashing Beacon. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fall off the tongue, so. Yeah. All right, RRFB, <laughs> thanks a lot. They've been, I know. <laughs> um, they've been having really good success with these things. The great thing is they're cheaper than signals. They're probably about $60,000 for an intersection, roughly. Um, and they've been having some really good compliance rates somewhere in the route, almost comparable to the, um, the Hawk signal. So somewhere at 90% compliance. Wow. Be great. That's great. Um, you know, it's always kind of, they're kind of the new, they're like the new kid on the block, so we don't know, maybe it's, Maybe that's going to go away over time, but at least for now. Needs a new name ASAP. What is that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like a, I need a bird name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. RR sounds like railway. Yeah. <laughs> Look yeah. up something. Well, that'd make him stop. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so the, here's just some some concerns. These are just some quick concerns on this. You know, um, right now you're not required to stop for a bike. If it's, in, if it's in traffic, you're required to stop for a pedestrian, but not for a bike, so that's kind of a little um, the issue on that. So is that, those treating, things, is that treating bikes as a vehicle? Is there a if they're, right, to, if they're a vehicle. Is there, there, so there isn't a requirement to stop for a vehicle, like that. Right, so if you were like on a stop sign. Are we treated like a vehicle, or are we in a gray area? I, I think the way that it looks at it a lot, I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> is that um, it's a, uh, if you're if you're on the road and you're acting as a vehicle, you, you're just just like a, a motor vehicle on that. And so, for example, if the flashing lights are flashing, cars necessarily don't have to stop. They probably will, um, but so that's going to be great. But in Seattle, if you're in a crosswalk, even if you're on your bike, right, they have to stop. Yes. So is there some kind of Paint that can make it so they have to stop. Yeah, make it a cross bike. Cross bike. Yeah. I hear this. Well, part of the point is that there is some confusion here, and drivers don't really understand what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Well, and they don't provide anyway. Right. Yeah. That's just a big thing. I get a lot of people yield to me as if I were a pedestrian, but I don't assume that they're not. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you just have to kind of take that chance. <laughs> so here's just a quick thing. Um, have we met our goals? Um, we need to count um, just to make sure, but we, not ju we just don't need numbers on, on bikes. We need to know, you know, how many women are riding out there? Are there children? Are there seniors? Um, and then, of course, how to do it. I always just hang out at an intersection and count is oftentimes the easiest. Uh, video. Um, video is becoming really advanced in normal days, so you can go ahead and use that. Great Britain. And then, uh, was it? Especially in Great Britain. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and then um, automatic counts. This is a really bad photo, but this is a, a loop detector, which is actually on bike lane downtown. Mm -hmm. So it has an automatic count. And then, of course, when to do it, when to do the counts. Um, oftentimes, you know, if it's really raining, of course, no one's gonna, you're not going to see a lot of stuff. It's really sunny, you're going to see a lot of people. So, you know, oftentimes just doing it on a regular basis around the same time pretty much helps. And, and different cities have different programs to do the counts. Um, I like the way that the new, I forgot, I know Alta is involved in it, but the um, they count four times a year type thing. Um, it's a national program on that. I, I, I think that's good. Um, Collisions. Uh, this is just one thing because I know um, oh, Anne has spoken. I don't, <laughs> I don't like that. I don't mind. That's awesome. <laughs> um, you know, collisions don't tell the whole story uh, because oftentimes there's so much stuff that happens out there. Collisions are, relatively speaking, a rare event, and we don't want to see them at all. Um, so, oftentimes when uh, we see studies for bike facilities and pedestrian facilities, we're looking at avoidance maneuvers. So you might see that driver who's driving la la la, all of a sudden 
pedestrian is walking up front and slams on brakes. Barely misses up. Well, technically that wasn't an accident, so there would be no collision report, so we wouldn't know about it. But if you're doing a study, that's a collision avoidance. We, someone saw something, made an invasive maneuver, something's not right on that. So that's why I said, you know, observations are, are key in knowing that. And oftentimes you'll see that if, when you do count, sometimes at crazy intersections, you'll see stuff like that. 17 meter misses, no collisions. <laughs> I, was actually, I, was actually, I was actually at an intersection down in Tucson doing a count, and I kid you not, I saw two accidents in like the time I was there. It was, and one of them was a bicyclist actually, who, um, who just violated, it was, it was a, not a, I, I think unfortunately the person was intoxicated. Um, <laughs> Just because the way that it happened, I mean, it was Never just, it, it, it didn't really help. Um, so, yeah, so um, thank you. I know I probably tried to accelerate the end there. I'm sorry about that. Um, but, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, that's good. <laughs> if you have any questions or something about, um, let me know. I, I'm around and love to talk about this stuff. So.